Right, welcome to this video about 8th edition. Uh, so what I thought I'd do in this video uh, is talk about how to play and then also uh, the changes that have taken place uh, with 8th edition. It is very different uh, in many respects to 7th edition. So I hope this video will be a help to those who are used to playing Warhammer 40,000 already and then really sort of talk about the changes that have taken place. If you learn the changes, um, it's just sort of an easier way uh, just to adapt to 8th edition coming along and then also hope hopefully a bit of help to those who are new to Warhammer 40,000 as well. Now, with 7th edition, a video like this would have been very long, probably would have broken up into different parts, but with 8th edition, there has been some serious uh, simplification of the rules that have taken place, uh, and I reckon I should be able to do this in one video here, just to give you an overview of, of uh, the changes that have taken place and a general idea of how to play uh, Warhammer 40,000 8th edition. Um, so, uh, that's the plan in this video. The reason why I reckon I can do it, 7th edition, that's pretty much your rules in here. If 8th edition, you think, oh, this is a big book, but actually, the actual section on the rules is very small indeed. The core rules runs from here through to here, fighting a battle. You're looking at just a dozen pages. And what they've done, uh, is inside the Dark Imperium box set, they've given you the core rules on this sheet. How to play is just there, so it's actually uh, been seriously simplified. Now, uh, for them to do that, there's been a, a lot of stuff cut out uh, and uh, made uh, more straightforward. Now, as to whether that's good or not, see, I'm not going to be all positive about 8th edition. I think there's some uh, things that are not so good with it. I'm not going to be 100% positive, I'm just going to try and be realistic uh, in the videos that are uh, put out there. Uh, but there is a, a saving grace here for Games Workshop. They've said that they're going to update the rules uh, with a General's Handbook type uh, book here. Uh, chapter approved, I think they're going to call it, where they're just going to, each year, they're going to update the rules, change things around, update points and so on. So if there are glaring problems with Ape, and you'd expect them to be, expect that to be because it's a brand new edition they're trying new things out then those real problems hopefully be highlighted by people and then they'll be sorted out ironed out and then uh, the the next update uh, will be a better version of the rules I, I think that's how it will go um, so it just depends on people agreeing as to what works and what doesn't so as I said we'll, we'll just cover the core rules here I'll skip some parts focusing more on changes that have taken place uh, so I have played a small game of 8th edition already, and uh, then we played some smaller uh, units as well. So a good way to get into it, if you're already used to playing 140,000 7th edition, then um, just go to a friend or whoever, or just you can uh, just line up some units yourself. Just do one unit versus one unit, just a regular infantry unit versus another regular infantry unit. Start small, and then uh, learn as you go along. If you're not sure on something, they refer to the rules, you just sort of learn uh, the different ways that the things that have been changed. And then, uh, so that's what we did. Um, and then we did a practice psychic phase, we just lined up two psychers and let them try and kill each other. Uh, we did that, we tried to do vehicles versus vehicles, we practiced that a little bit. And then uh, we felt that it pretty picked up the rules pretty good. So we did a small, a small game, no terrain, just laid out some uh, units. And uh, it seemed to, go pretty well. We pretty much learned uh, a good chunk of the rules uh, as we went along. So I'd recommend that to you. If you're going to try and learn 8th edition, just start really small, one unit versus one unit, and then expand it out, and then try different phases, different unit types, and then do a small game from there. We had really good, it was really good fun. So from that, sort of got an idea of how the rules work here. Uh, now the comment section is going to be really important in this video uh, for discussion about whether you think the rules are good or not, different aspects of the rules, and then also uh, if there is something I've not said quite right here, then uh, the comment section, you can pick that up, uh, point out uh, the correct interpretation of the rules. I do have some questions about the rules as well, um, so you can answer those in the comment section. So uh, tune into this video here, but also check the comment section uh, from other uh, subscribers and players, uh, and then you'll see uh, about the correct interpretation of the rules uh, from there as well. So, uh, core rules, uh, on to turns then. Not going to do missions or anything like that, and this is just pretty much how to play a game. Uh, so, the battle round, as they call it now, it's movement phase, psychic phase, shooting phase, charging phase, 
fight phase and then morale phase is pretty much as it was in seventh. Morale is always at the end now. It used to be in, in any phase. So you could, might have to do morale test in a psychic phase, uh, a shooting phase, end of combat. But now, say if you take casualties in shooting, you just leave it, wait till the very end of the turn to do your morale, which is fine, but no problem with that at all. It sounds a good idea. So you just go straight into movement phase then, it's the next part. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about this straight away. Um, and I talked about it in the review for the 8th edition rulebook. Came to the back of the rulebook looking for the uh, special rules section, like you have in 7th uh, edition, you know, with, with things like Jink and Skyfire, that kind of thing. There's nothing there, that, it, that section is gone. And uh, what Games Workshop have done, so I've got uh, Index Xenos here, is all the special rules are in the stats line. Uh, for uh, that unit. So Colt Chimera and then your war gear options are all here but look, abilities uh, is all linked in to this. You don't have to go around the rule book searching for each of these uh, different abilities. It's all in there uh, in each of the stat lines. Now as we were playing the game uh, we found that was really helpful. You could just leave your page open for your faction and then all your rules are there and we were hardly referring to the rule book. So that's a good move uh, that Games Workshop have done. It's streamlined everything. Everything you need to know. Your weapons are here as well. Uh, your movement, your stats for all of that. Your damage uh, information is there as well. Your wargear options are all there. Um, how to build a unit as well. What you know, units you can take is all uh, within the index. Uh, unit entries just there. So we thought that, I thought that was a really good change. So. And if you're wondering who I was playing game with, it's someone who hasn't appeared on the channel yet. And uh, I was using an army that hasn't appeared on the channel, and then so was he. So <laughs> just to keep a look out for two armies uh, that may appear uh, on both of the channels in the near future. But that's for uh, the days ahead. So, uh, so movement phase then, you just look up your movement. Things have changed uh, for movement here. Each unit, vehicle, whatever it may be, has its own movement characteristic. So uh, Tau Piranha here is movement 16. So uh, that's a simplification. Remember we had um, combat speed, cruising speed, flat out, it's all gone. Um, it is movement 16, you can go as, as right the way up to that or less, whatever you want. Uh, I think pivoting has disappeared as well. So pivoting uh, has gone also. Uh, I do believe, don't correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, vehicles can advance now or run as it used to be in seventh edition which is just a D6, and you declare that in your movement phase. There's no more running in the shooting phase, it's all done uh, in the movement phase. So, model can move in any direction. Um, so, uh, they do cover here, no part of the model's base or hull can move further than this. So there's no more of that um, deploying flat, pivoting to gain an extra few inches, and then moving. Um, it's just you can't go further than your move distance. Uh, if the data sheet for a model says it can fly, it can move over models, it's fine. Uh, there's minimum moves uh, for vehicles that, uh, for fly vehicles that have to go minimum distance, that can cause some trouble, same as seventh. Uh, enemy models, you can't be within an inch, it's all fine. Uh, falling back. Now this is a, a sticking point that we had, and maybe you've come across this already. It's, uh, so this is an area that we had trouble with. So falling back, units start the movement phase. Uh, units start the movement phase within an inch of an enemy unit. This is, means they're in combat. Can either remain stationary, so you can stay in combat, or fall back. So you can, you're now allowed to leave combat. I don't think there's any initiative test to do it. Um, you just de declare, I'm moving away out of combat. You can walk away. But there are penalties to it. If you choose to fall back, the unit must end its move more than an inch away from all enemy units. If a unit falls back, it cannot advance or run. Uh, so you just do a normal move, and then that's it. You can't charge and uh, later that turn. The unit that falls back also cannot shoot later that turn unless it can fly. So this created a, a, a problem. Now, I hope I'm wrong, but you just have to see, check the comment section on this one. So we had a situation with a, uh, a land raider 
and it was charged by unit in combat. Then on the following turn, uh, the player who had the land raider pulled the land raider out of combat because he wanted to shoot. But I think according to these rules here, a unit that falls back also cannot shoot unless it can fly. So the land raider pulled out of combat and then just sat there. It can't do anything. It can't. Um, it can't shoot. It's not allowed to do anything. Uh, so if we're wondering about whether that's the case or not. Uh, I think that's the way the rules is, but it, it creates a problem. Uh, if you pull out of combat and you can't do anything with that unit, the unit that charged you can just charge you again. And if you pull out of combat, you can't shoot, you can charge you again. And now you've got a situation where a vehicle could be chased uh, by another unit um, and just be denied shooting because it keeps being locked in combat all the time. So leave that in the comments section there about falling back. Um, but that seems to be the interpretation there. But generally that rule uh, is for combat, if you want to pull back, then you can. Uh, it's quite a cool tactic. I mean, if you've got guardsmen in combat, then it's so much of a chance you can pull them out. Then that frees up other units to shoot at the enemy uh, unit just there. So uh, that creates that dynamic to the game. So advancing here or running, it's been brought from the shooting phase into the movement phase. When you pick a unit to move in the movement phase, you can declare that it will advance, roll a dice, add the result to the movement characteristics of all models in the unit for that movement phase. You know that advances can't shoot or charge later that turn, unless there's an, a rule that says that they can, which there are for some factions. Probably model syndrome, uh, reinforcements, I need to worry about that, that's for reserves and so on. There's re-rolls, um, that's the usual, I believe, uh, roll-off sequencing, so we'll just skip that part there. So it's pretty, pretty brief there uh, for movement. So, highlighted one potential problem there, but check the comment section to see what people are saying. Then, uh, second is the psychic phase. And again, tons of stuff has been cut out of the psychic phase. Just, just, uh, they've just chopped out loads of stuff. S a severe uh, amount of uh, simplification being done. Uh, so, psychic phase then, you choose a psyker, so you don't roll to see how many. Uh, psychic dice there are and you add up all the mastery levels and that kind of stuff, that's all gone. Choose a psyker and a power. Uh, you make, uh, just to talk about psychers, um, you can just show you here. So I'll just look up, let's say Harlequin's here, because they have a psyker, Shadow's here. Psyker, um, this model, uh, this model can attempt to manifest two psychic powers in each friendly psychic phase. So there is that old mastery level reflection. Some can manifest more powers than others. That's still there as well. Um, that's no problem. Uh, Space Marine Librarian, uh, they can manifest three as there's different abilities, uh, depending on what model it is. So that still remains. Choose a psychic and a power. Make a psychic test, uh, which will cover in a moment. And the enemy takes makes deny the witch, and then you resolve the psychic power. So quite straightforward. Uh, just to mention Perils of the Warp, it is now, uh, if you roll a double one or a double six when you're trying to make that psychic test, then you suffer Perils of the Warp. That whole table of different results that you could get has gone. Again, simplified. Uh, it's now, the Psyker suffers D3 Mortal Wounds. Mortal Wounds is something new. Uh, so you have your regular armor save, you have an invun save, which can't be affected by AP. Um, similar to 7th, uh, but they have mortal wounds. Mortal wounds deny everything. It's like a D type wound, it just ignores everything. So Psycho now, if he does suffer perils of the warp, it's D3 mortal wounds, and there's no other option there. It's just, he's just going to get wounded. Um, it says that uh, if the Psycho is slain, uh, then the power automatically fails. Each unit within 6. Friend or foe suffers D3 mortal wounds, it's horrendous, as the Psyker is dragged into the warp, or else detonates in a burst of empiric feedback. So it's okay, but in the short game we played, it happened a, <laughs> happened a couple of times. Uh, so, some models notice being a Psyker in a data sheet, Psykers can manifest other unworldly abilities. Uh, the, the powers a Psyker knows, and the number of powers they can attempt to manifest or deny each psychic phase are detailed in their data sheet. Yeah, so you just, again, you're just referring back to your data sheet, have it laid out. It's, it's nice and logical. That's a good strength here to 8th edition. I have to say, 8th edition is extremely uh, well organised. You know, 5th uh, edition, 6th, sixth, sixth, definitely. 7th edition as well. The rule book, 
it was a bit chaotic at times. You're flicking around trying to find stuff. Difficult. Eighth edition is exceptionally well organized. It's very, very logically put together. The books are very, very logically done. And in the uh, even these index books here are very, very well organized as well. So they've done an excellent job of that. Um, so, all psychic, all psychers know the smite psychic powers. Every psyker knows smite, uh, which I'll cover in just a moment. Some know other powers instead of or addition to smite. The model's data sheet tells you. Okay, I will uh, turn up here to give you an example. So go to Harlequins again. Maybe you can guess what army I was using. <laughs> Probably giving it away. Yeah, but anyway, Harlequins. Um, Shadow Seer. So uh, one one thing to mention: wounds have gone up. So you, you're hearing about the deadly effects of um, Perils of the Warp. Shadow Seer, for example, used to have three wounds; it's got five now. So there's a bit more absorption there for damage. Uh, but coming back to you, here we go. So again, whether this is good or bad, psychic powers now. So psychers for Harlequins take the Phantasmin Seat Discipline. There's three to choose from, and that's it. So, there's no access to any others. That is all they have, three powers now. They used to have open, remember all the different um, psychic disciplines? It's all gone, just three here. So, uh, those are covered. I'll cover this in more detail uh, in the review index review videos I'm planning to do. Uh, there's three of them there that he's got access to as well as Smite, which is, it's, uh, it is cut down, um, and here it says, before the battle, generate psychic powers for psychers that can use powers from the Phantasmic Discipline, using the table below. You can either roll a D3 to generate their powers randomly, uh, re any duplicates, or you can select the powers you wish to psycher to have. <laughs> so, I'd be wondering, why, why would you randomise if you could choose? <laughs> I don't know, so it's a bit... Well, that was a bit strange, but so you can actually choose your power now as well if you want to. You don't even have to roll a dice. You can say, I like that one. I want that one, and then you can you can add it. So another change there as well. But very simplified. So actually um, we found the psychic phase a little bit boring, dare I say it, uh, because you're just trying to smite each other uh, each turn. So there you go. Uh, so smite then. Which is a horrendously uh, wicked power here. Smite has a warp charge value of five. So the warp charge value it just means you have to. Uh, here, I'll cover it in a moment. Uh, if manifested, the closest enemy, closest visible enemy unit within 18 suffers D3 mortal wounds. So it just ignores invuns and, and tough strength and toughness and all that stuff. So it's a, it's a deadly attack. If the result of the psychic test was more than 10, so if you're a double five, a six, and a five, or double six. Target suffers D6 mortal wounds instead. So it's a nasty power. So, making a psychic test. A psychic can attempt to manifest a psychic power they know by taking a psychic test. To do so, roll 2D6. If the total is equal to or greater than the warp charge value, the power successfully manifested. So you roll two dice. I roll a six in total. I need a five to make smite go off. I've made it go off. So now it's active, it's going to go off. A psychic cannot attempt to manifest the same psychic power more than once in a turn. So you can't duplicate smite over and over. So very, very simple, very, very straightforward. Some powers are more deadly and then they're harder to manifest. You might need an eight, for example, on 2d6. Others not so powerful. You might need a, a five or, or a four or six, whatever. So it's that. So then deny the witch. And again, deny the witch has changed. A psychic can attempt to resist a psychic power that's been manifested by an enemy model within 24 uh, by taking a Deny the Witch test. So anyone within 24, they manifest it. If you've got a psycho, he can try and stop it. This takes place immediately, even though it's not your turn. To do so, you roll 2d6. If the total is greater than the result of the psychic test, that manifests the power has been resisted and its effects are negated. So I rolled a 6, for example. Uh, they, if his the opponent's got a psyker uh, within 24 and they want to deny it, then they just need to beat six, not equal it, but they need to beat six on 2d6 and it stops the power. So there's no more like a handful of dice being sixes and calculating how many, choosing how many dice you can use to stop it. You just say, right, I'm gonna use a psyker to stop the power. 
Only one attempt to deny each successfully manifested psychic power can be made each turn, so you can't stack up a load of psychers and say, right, I'm going to try and deny this power hit with him, him and him. It's only one psyker against one power. So they capped all that off. So it's okay. It's, it's all right. It's very smooth running here, the psychic phase. Uh, I think Games Workshop was listening to him talking. They were saying that the psychic phase was beginning to turn into an, a second shooting phase, and it wasn't really fair. So they've, they've, they've cut it down a fair bit. So which is good. They could have gone the other direction and made magic and psychic powers ridiculously powerful and that could have spoiled 40k, so uh, it's a good direction I think they've gone. Uh, regardless of the number of psychers you have within 24, da, 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 da. so. So psychers are helpful for, as the same in seventh, for casting powers and then for resisting uh, powers coming through as well. If you've got no psyker to protect your army, you can't even attempt to stop psychic powers from coming through. So, and there are times when there's some nasty powers that you, you want to try and stand some chance of trying to stop. So then you resolve your psychic power, which is goes into your en your entry in your index book. So that's psychic phase. All those charts are gone. All the different disciplines are gone. A lot of calculating's disappeared. It's just here's my power. I'm going to try and manifest it. I'm going to try and block it. Don't roll a double six or a double one. Pretty much. See how straightforward this has become. Uh, which is good, it, it streamlines everything. Games are really nice and quick, you, you don't need to keep flicking through books, there's going to be loads of time freed up with the games for definite. The danger is of over simplifying things and things start to get a bit unrealistic, um, is the danger. I've pointed out a couple of little areas here. Uh, the falling back thing at the moment is a, is a glaring one, uh, just there. We'll move on and we'll cover the shooting phase next. All right, so shooting phase here is uh, choosing it to shoot with, choose your target, choose what weapons you're going to use, and then resolve your attacks. You roll to hit as before, you roll to wound as before. The enemy allocates the wounds. Uh, okay, so that has changed. It was our closest model. But now it's you just allocate your wounds, which is back to how it used to be a while back, I believe, in sixth or fifth edition. Um, so no longer is it the closest model. It's quite handy if you're trying to charge a target. You can take your models off from the back. Uh, it means you can keep close to the enemy. You can stick a character uh, or, or a model with a really good weapon right out the front, and you can take off models around him. He doesn't have to die first. So that's all gone. Uh, so that eases things up a bit, not, not getting all... Um, hung up about positioning your models, it doesn't really matter, you just pick out what units or what models you want to die. Uh, enemy makes saving throws, and then you inflict your damage. If you fail your saving throws, you take the relevant models off. So quite straightforward. There's fast dice rolling here, it's just rolling multiple dice at the same time. Characters have aura abilities, so characters uh, don't join units anymore. They sort of hang around units, and then usually sort of in six inches, sometimes maybe it's more, uh, they have an influence and they affect multiple units. You know, a character you stick it with a unit, he affects that unit, but now a character nearby, multiple units can affect multiple units uh, with his abilities, so that's quite cool. Uh, so that's that. We'll cover characters I'll talked about here. But look, it's just, it's very short entries here. Uh, so, choosing it to shoot with. In your shooting phase, you can shoot with models armed with ranged weapons. First, you must pick one of your units to shoot with. You may not pick a unit that advanced or fell back. Yes, yeah, clarified here. You can't shoot a unit that fell back. Can't even snap shoot. So, I mean, that could create real tactical problems. And think about things like the situation you come as a land raider and it's been chased by Harlequin jet bikes. That land, land raider is not going to be able to escape. He finds himself isolated in the game. And you've got jet bikes moving up 16, charging in. Not worried about causing damage, but now they're locking him in combat. He then has to fall back and pull out. He's not allowed to shoot. Harlequin is charging again. Fall back. That was the that was the problem. Uh, so you can't shoot for that reason, or uh, a unit that was within an inch of an enemy unit. So you're locked in combat. I believe though pistols now are different. Pistols you can shoot whilst within an inch, or in other words, shoot whilst you're in combat. Unless otherwise stated, each model in the unit attacks with all the ranged weapons it is armed with. That's interesting as well. Um, which means, just to give you an example, 
Going back to uh, Harlequins again. So, uh, for example, the Skyweaver jet bikes are armed with standard armament for them is Shuriken Cannon and Star Bowlers. So There's two shooting weapons. So now, according to this, uh, they can fire both. Now, they could do that in seventh, actually, um, in the entry for these. They were a two man jet bike, they could fire two weapons, but it's the same here. Um, you can fire all of your weapons unless otherwise stated. So, makes things interesting. Um, so worth bearing that in mind, because in that game I, I was firing just choosing one or the other weapon, but we've, I've since learned that you can actually fire all the weapons that you're armed with. Uh, so I think that counts for things like dreadnoughts, tanks, all that kind of stuff, armed with multiple weapons, just fire everything. I, I do think shooting is, it's the age of shooting here with 8th edition, just a lot more stuff can shoot, everything can shoot everything. A lot more, there's, there's new deadly weapons coming out as well, so I think shooting's crucial, absolutely crucial in 40k now uh, for 8th edition. After all units, mod, units models are fired, you can choose another unit to shoot with until uh, all eligible units you want to shoot with are done. So, alright, because you just work for one unit at a time. Choose your targets. Now, this is another change. Uh, having chosen a shooting unit, you must pick the target unit or units for the attack. So you can now split fire in any way that you want. There's no restriction here. So if you've got a 10 man tactical squad and you want uh, each man to fire a separate target, so one shot at each target, if there's 10 targets and you go ahead, you can do that. So tactical squads are quite cool. You can, the old philosophy that I had uh, with Imperial Fist, you bury a LAS cannon inside. Um, and the others act as a bodyguard. That works really well now with 8th edition um, because the bolters can fire at one target, the laser cannon can fire at another. Split fire is completely uh, freed up now uh, in this edition, which is realistic. This is a good change. In order to target an enemy unit, model from that unit must be within the range of the weapon. It's the usual, be visible to the shooting model. Uh, if unsure, stoop down and get a look from behind the shooting model and by model, I think they mean it. just any model. We're talking about uh, you know, dreadnoughts, vehicles, infantry, everything. Shooting model to see if, if any part of the target is visible for the purposes of determining visibility. A model can see through other models uh, in its own unit. So you just got to look, have I got line of sight basically to hit? Now this created another issue as we were playing and that was with the, the land raider. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but for vehicles now, um, there's no separate entry. And again, this is another, you know, remember in 7th edition you had entries for jet bikes, jump infantry, monstrous creatures, vehicles. It's all gone. It's disappeared. All the rules for that particular unit type is in its stats inside the book. There's nothing here on vehicles. Uh, there's hardly any mention of it. It's all, it's all out there in those separate books. Um, so from what I can gather, uh, front side and rear arc is gone, that's all been scrapped. So if you shoot from the behind, to the side, to the front, makes no odds at all uh, for hitting that vehicle. Uh, so there's that, which wasn't too keen. I like the idea of ambushing uh, vehicles from behind, hitting the rear armour. Uh, that's realistic, you know, um, in, historically speaking, uh, like in World War II, tanks were better armed on the front than they were on the side. Uh, and then it makes sense that 40k would be the same. Uh, a rhino is going to have more armor at the front uh, than it is at the back. Predator definitely. Um, Lima Russ for sure, but it seems to be that doesn't make any difference now. So you can, technically speaking, you can deploy your, your Lima Russes with their back ends facing the opponent, and it's not going to make any difference. So. Not so sure. I mean, the reason why I've done that is to cut out. You cut out because there used to be arguments over the angles. Am I inside? Am I uh, am I firing at the side armor, rear armor? There's arguments about it. Check your angles, and it slowed the game down. Now it doesn't matter. So that whole discussion's not going to take place in the game. So that's the good side of it. Bad side of it is you lose a bit of realism. Realism. Uh, so, so the issue here was then you check line of sight by stooping down to the model. Uh, which is fine for infantry and for dreadnoughts and that as well. But for vehicles, if any part of the model can see the target, not the weapon. So technically, again, if I'm wrong, leave it in the comment section, but technically speaking, 
Uh, say you've got a predator with his las cannon on top um, and he's parked up against the building and uh, the top part of the building blocks off the las cannon so it kind of the weapon can't see but the under part of the model can see through then the las cannon can shoot the weapon doesn't need to have line of sight it just needs to be any part of the model needs to have line of sight so again is that i don't think that's realistic but i think it's representing that the vehicle is in that area it may not be in that exact position you've placed it on the table you know it can adjust and move to find a good line of sight to shoot with that's the kind of idea behind it i think so it's just a representation that it's in that building not necessarily exactly as you see it on the table so i think that's the sort of way uh, they're explaining it. Another way they've, they've shortened this down as well, you've got a little bit of fluff here, you know, guns, thunder and shrapnel falls and so on, and then that's it, the rest is just rules. So that's cut off a lot of, gets you straight to the point as well. And this is handy, if the rules are all in here, you can just carry this around on the table, which we had had this laid out, um, so it's good. But anyway, that's another area Leave your comments on that one. Models cannot target enemy units that are within an inch of friendly models. If they're in combat, risk of hitting their own troops is too great. Okay. Choose your ranged weapon. The weapon a model has listed in the data sheet in the book. If a model has several weapons, it can shoot all of them at the same target, or it can shoot at, different, at a different enemy unit. So yes, you can split five of your tanks now. Imperial Guard players are really happy about this. Uh, you can fire your sponsons now at one target, uh, demolish a cannon another, las cannon at something else, you can go ahead and do that, no problem at all. I think all of the restrictions, most of the restrictions, and there are some that remain, there's a minus for firing heavy weapons for example, there's a bonus, uh, there's, a, there's some, but a lot of the technical rules about what weapons can fire, you remember if, if you move at cruising speed you can only fire this much, um, that's all disappeared, those restrictions are gone, uh, there's just a couple of modifiers but hardly anything, a severe amount of simplification has taken place of that as well. Uh, if a model has several weapons it can shoot all of them at the same target or it can shoot at different targets. Similar, similarly, if a unit contains more than one model they can shoot at the same or different targets as you choose in either case to clear how you're split the unit's shooting before any dice are rolled. Right, so you have to declare it. And the old fact, the old way of um, if you had a super heavy, you had to declare what each weapon was going to fire at. You now have to do that when you shoot uh, any unit. Uh, and resolve all the shots against one target before moving on to the next. So it's, it's quite, it's nice and straightforward. It's okay. Number of attacks. Each time model shoots a ranged weapon, it will make a number of attacks. You roll one dice for each attack being made. The number of attacks a model can make with its weapons uh, is found on the profile, along with the weapon's type. All the details are all there. Okay. So yeah, characters next. Uh, so for characters, some models are noted as being a character on their data sheets. It tells you in the uh, the index. Heroes, officers, prophets, warlords are powerful individuals that can have a great impact on the course of the battle. The swirling maelstrom of the battlefield can make it difficult to pick out such individuals as targets. However, a character targets however a character can only be chosen as a target in a shooting phase if they are the closest visible enemy unit to the model that is shooting so keep your characters at the back um, is the sensible thing to do no more lookouts sir all disappeared as well uh, this does not apply to characters with a wounds characteristic of 10 or more due to their sheer size so you can't hide uh, a Gorkonaut, I'm not talking about, no, characters are talking about, you can't hide um, a, just trying to think what would have lots of wounds, one of the big tyranny monstrous creatures, uh, perhaps that has 10 wounds or more, uh, you can't hide that behind a load of gaunts and then your opponent's not allowed to fire at them. Uh, if there's 10 or more wounds, then you're allowed uh, to fire at them, even if they're not the closest unit. Now, it sounds quite restrictive, but there are, in the entries, there are some units that are allowed to ignore that rule, snipers and so on, they can certain units they can pick out characters they don't need to be the closest model uh, it also means you can go for ambush type effects where you drop pod down you try and catch a character who's behind a unit that you're then allowed to shoot him if he's the closest model and you can try and ambush and assassinate um, them that way so that creates a nice dynamic to the game as well sometimes you want to protect a character you'll dot your models 
keeping them an inch away, but dot them all the way around him, making a complete circle so he's protected from all angles. Yeah, and then also, uh, yeah, no, that's how it works, yeah, so you can do it that way. So that's the shooting phase there. Now they do cover um, weapon types here as well. Shooting phase, you see it's a lot, it's, it's a bit more in depth here uh, than the other uh, two phases that we've looked at. So the most important rule is a quote here, don't need to worry about that. So weapon types, there are five types of ranged weapon. Uh, let's just look. If a weapon has more than one attack, it must make all of its attacks against the same target unit. Right, so yeah, so you've got rapid fire, uh, a rapid fire las gun. You can't split that single las gun shots. They've all got to be at the one target, that's fine. Each type of ranged weapon also has an additional rules that depending upon the situation may affect the accuracy of the weapon. Okay, so you have assault weapons. They fire so rapidly or indiscriminately that they can be shot from the hip as warriors dash forwards into combat. A model of an assault weapon can fire even if it advanced or it ran uh, earlier that turn. If it does so, you must subtract one from any to hit rolls when firing uh, that weapon this turn. So, and again, this was this came out quite quite a tactical use for this. You got a nasty assault weapon. Um, there was a situation in the game we were playing where one of these models had a really good assault weapon. It advanced, it moved and advanced, and I thought, oh, his, his movement's finished. But then he shot with it because it was an assault weapon. So it gives you a little bit more reach with some of your uh, assault type weapons. Then uh, heavy weapons, which you're familiar with in seventh. If a model with a heavy weapon moves in its movement phase, it's minus one from your hit rolls when you fire. That's it. So devastator squads can move just beyond minus one to hit. Uh, tanks, unless there's a rule that overrides this, um, if they move with heavy weapon, they might need to take a minus one to hit as well. Uh, rapid fire, uh, which again is a familiar term. A model firing a rapid fire weapon doubles the number of attacks it makes if its target is within half the weapon's maximum range, as per usual. Grenade, each time a unit shoots, a single model in the unit that is equipped with grenades may throw it instead of firing another weapon. That's again, same as 7th edition, just one model can throw a grenade. No problem at all. And then pistol, a model that can f fire a pistol model can fire a pistol even if they are within an inch of its own unit. So yes, you can fire pistols whilst you're in close combat. I take it you do that in the movement for, in, in the shooting phase. You don't wait till combat, I believe. No. So there's a chance where your opponent strikes you in combat. There's a chance that you can gun them down with your pistols. Which is cool. I mean, you look at any, you look at the different artworks uh, in 40k, you see units fighting each other. They're in close combat, but a lot of the time you, they are trying to fire pistols at each other. So. Um, that's quite realistic, I think. It's no problem at all. And then when you do that, um, you do your shooting with the pistols in close combat. You don't do morale check. You wait until the very end of the turn to do it. So just do your shooting, resolve your damage, and then just carry on and uh, on with the rest of the turn. Each time a model equipped with both a pistol and another type of ranged weapon, e.g. a pistol and a rapid fire weapon, so bolter, shoots, it can either shoot with its pistol or pistols, or with all of its other weapons. Choose which it will fire, pistols or non-pistols, before making hit rolls. So that clarifies that. So Space Marine um, cannot uh, move forwards and then rapid fire his bolt gun and then pull out his pistol and then fire that as well. Saying so you can't do that. You've got to choose which type you want. Um, from the, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like with rapid fire now, you can rapid fire your weapons and charge. I could be wrong on that, but just, just from this section here, it looks like there's no restriction. No restriction for heavy either. We'll see as we come to uh, the charge phase, what restrictions there are, um, but that may well be the case. So that's the different weapon types, very straightforward. Uh, so then you're on resolve attacks. Attacks we made one at a time, or in some cases you can roll for multiple attacks together. So you roll to hit. Uh, each time model makes an attack roll dice. If the model, if the roll is equal to a greater than the ballistic skill characteristic, then it scores a hit. The weapon it's using. If it attacks fouls, uh, you don't get the hit. A one always fouls, irrespective of any modifiers, which is just usual. So 
Uh, so you go here, a riptide for example. It tells you their, uh, their ballistic skill in the entry. So he has a stat line just to the side here. Um, so uh, BS 4 plus. So you don't look at your chart anymore uh, in the rule book. Your BS is always listed um, in your index entry. All the times, always here. And then an ethereal, ballistic skill four. Cadre five blade, ballistic skill. Uh, sorry, it's not ballistic skill. It's ballist, uh, ballistic skill four plus. Uh, a fire blade, ballistic skill two plus. That's how it works. You don't get a value, a characteristic anymore. And you just get what you need to hit with the dice. So you get your hits, then you roll to wound. If an attack scores a hit, you need to roll to wound. Uh, now this has changed. The roll is the roll required is determined by comparing the strength to the toughness. But it's all now by remember that larger chart with you take your toughness, compare it to the you take your strength, compare it to the toughness. Now it's just this chart here for everything. If the strength is twice or more than the toughness, it's a two to wound. If it's greater so for example so for example the top one here if it's strength eight toughness four that's twice or more of the toughness that's a two to win if the strength is greater than the toughness so if it's strength five toughness four it's a three plus to win if it's equal strength four toughness four it's four plus if it's lower so a las gun strength three against toughness four would be fives to win if it's half or less so if you are on strength two toughness four or worse then it's sixes to win. So that throws open the possibility that anything can win anything. Some are saying it's not realistic at all. You shouldn't be able to fire las guns at a land raider hoping to wound it. There should be no chance at all. I was saying, well, there's the off chance that it could damage. Um, I mean, you would need a six to wound, and then the um, uh, a player of a land raider then have, a, I believe, a two plus to, to save it. So it's, it is highly unlikely, but the odds are there that you can cause damage. So that's another area of not so. I, I think they should have made a cutoff point. If the strength is uh, half or less, then you can't wound something like that, or some kind of cutoff point for that. Just to add to that, would have been uh, cut out a lot of um, unrealistic. That's the unrealistic part just there, and they could have uh, they could fix that. But. Uh, so you allocate your wounds. If an attack successfully wounds the target, the player commanding the target unit allocates the wound to any model in the unit. The chosen model does not have to be within range or visible. Either. So you just any, absolutely any model you want. No restriction. If a model in the target unit has already lost any wounds, the damage must be allocated to that model. Okay, so you can't distribute wounds. That's good. They've put that in. Uh, you do have to take off whole models at a time. So you can't... You, Mega Knobs have got three wounds each now. You can't just spread all your wounds out the whole game. <laughs> you have to you have to take off whole models. Yep. Yep, okay, that's fine. Saving throw. The player commanding the target unit then makes a saving throw by rolling a dice, modifying the roll by the arm penetration characteristic. Yep, yeah, so you have a, a AP now for weapons. But it's it's instead instead of AP. Say for example, the weapon is AP three. Uh, that means that anything with a three plus armor save just dies. That's it. It bypasses the army. You're dead. But now um, AP. I had seventh edition. There. Now AP three uh, has a minus off your armor save instead. So let's give you an example here. A razor razor shark strike fighter missile pod. Range 36, Assault 2, it's Strength 7, and then it's not AP 4, it's just AP minus 1. So a Terminator's armor save would drop from a 2 plus to a 3 plus. Uh, a Guardsman's armor save would drop from a 5 plus to a 6 plus. Space Rain, 3 plus to a 4 plus. That's the way AP works now. It's going back to an old system, can't remember what edition it was, uh, but that's how 40k used to be. And I think it's realistic, got no problem with the AP value system at all. Uh, the best that you can get is minus AP, uh, minus 4 AP. That's unlike the weapons that used to be AP1, like multi melters and so on. So they can cause uh, a fair bit of damage. Uh, but it means that a lot of units now, Humble Guardsmen, their flak armor is going to help them out a lot more than it used to. 
it, well, I, be I believe against a regular bolt out, a guardsman now get a 5 plus armor save with no modifiers. So it's going to toughen them up a fair bit. So that's just saving throws. One always fails. Uh, inflict damage. The damage inflicted is equal to the damage characteristic of the weapon. So, let's have a look here. Yeah. So, uh, for example, I mean, this is a melee weapon, but it's the same for shooting. Uh, a Swarm Lord here has Bone Sabers uh, in combat. It's AP minus three, so they're, they're a real nasty weapon. And then the damage is D6 damage. You don't just cause one wound uh, with each hit that successfully goes through. Once you've caused your wound, your opponent's failed the save, you then roll a D6 to see how many wounds you cause. So, that's a nasty one. D6 is nasty. It's about as nasty as you can get. Other ones have D3 or sometimes it's a straight amount of damage with no randomness to it. For example, a one-eye here with monstrous crushing claws, his strength times two, AP minus three, and then damage is just a straight three. So there's no randomness there. That makes that kind of weapon quite reliable. Just to give you an example. So that's that, that's damage. Um, just need to clarify something here. The damage effect is equal to the damage characteristic of the weapon used in the attack. A model loses one wound for each point of damage it suffers. If a model's wound is reduced to zero, it is either slain or destroyed or removed from play. If a model loses several wounds from a shooting attack and is destroyed, any excess damage inflicted by that attack is lost and has no effect. Um, so that means a LAS cannon hits uh, a space marine who's got one wound, it inflicts four points of damage. Uh, it's a D6, I think, so it rolls a four, four points of damage. It doesn't spread onto the other models. That whole model takes all of that damage. Uh, is removed and it doesn't flow on to the other models in the unit. So they've clarified that there as well, which is pretty much the same as it was um, in 7th edition. But like instant death just affects that one model that's been hit, it doesn't flow on to uh, the other models. Uh, then we've got invun saves. Uh, you just choose what save you want to use. Um, it's never modified by the AP uh, of a weapon. And I believe. Yes, here it is. You can choose to use either its normal save characteristic or its invun. I heard a room that said you get to use your armor value and then your invun save on top. That's not true. You still, just like 7th edition, you choose. I'm going to use my armor save if it's better or I'm going to use my invun save. And you can't use both there for invun saves. Right, then you've got terrain and cover. <laughs> it's just, just this box now. <laughs> so it's been seriously cut down. Now, if unit is entirely on or within any terrain feature, so a woods, a bunker, uh, a crater, add one to its saving throws against shooting attacks to represent the cover received from the terrain. Invun saves are unaffected. Units gain no benefit from cover in the fight subface. So that is a. S now, I'd imagine they might build upon that. Some cover might give you a bit of a more of a bonus, something like that. But the basic rules for cover is any type of cover. Uh, obscure targets gone. So I, I take it now, you could put a tank on top of a crater and you'll get plus one saving throw. Yep, I reckon. I could be wrong, but I can't see, and again, leave this in the comment section, I can't see anything here that talks about obscured targets. Uh, so, could be wrong on that one. Uh, but I think that is the case, just to use any type of terrain then you get plus one cover save. Uh, mortal wounds. Some attacks inflict mortal wounds. Uh, so it's, you don't roll uh, a, yeah, do not make a wound roll or saving throw, uh, including invun saves against mortal wounds. Just allocate them as you would any other. Uh, inflict damage to a model in the target unit as described above. Uh, unlike, unlike normal attacks, excess damage from attacks that inflict mortal wounds is not lost. Instead, keep allocating damage to another model in the target unit until evil or all the damage has been allocated to the target unit is destroyed. Uh, so, yes, so wounds do flow over from that uh, for mortal wounds. So that's that covered. So a lot of simplification here. Not so sure about this cover here. That could lead to, again, uh, being kept nice and simple. No problem with that, but at the cost of losing out on realistic Realist, uh, realism is uh, sacrificed for the sake of uh, 
things, uh, keeping things simple. So then uh, phase number four is the charge phase. So charge sequence is uh, choose unit to charge with, you choose your target, uh, enemy resolves overwatch, overwatch is still here in 8th edition, you roll 2d6 and make your charge move. So units to charge with any of your units within 12 of the enemy in your charge phase can make a charge move. You may not choose a unit that advanced or fell back, nor one that started the phase within an inch of the enemy. So if you're already locked in combat, you can't charge into it again. Um, choose your target. Once you've chosen an eligible unit, elect, or select one or more enemy units within 12 of them as the targets of the charge. Each target unit can then attempt to fire uh, overwatch. So, yes, so that's fine. That's overwatch, so all the same as usual. Uh, but you can split your charges or disorder charges it used to be um, in 7th edition. Uh, overwatch is next. Each time a charge is declared against a unit, the target unit can immediately fire overwatch as the would-be attacker. At the would-be attacker, a unit can potentially fire overwatch several times a turn, though it cannot fire uh, if there aren't any models within an inch of it. Right, okay, so um, you charge, one unit declares a charge, fire overwatch at it, it doesn't actually reach you in combat, another unit tries to charge you, you are allowed to then fire at that other target as well. Overwatch is resolved like a normal shooting attack, uh, albeit on resolved enemy's charge phase, and uses all the normal rules, except that a six is always required for a successful hit roll. Um, so, yep, irrespective of the uh, the model's ballistic skill or any other modifiers. Question here about flamers. Um, they get like d6 shots. Um, sometimes the stats will say uh, these sh uh, hits, these shots automatically hit the target. Is it automatic in close com is, is it automatic in Overwatch or even uh, do those shots need sixes to hit? I'm not sure about that one for flamers. There. So then number four is make charge move. After any overwatch has been resolved, roll 2d6. Uh, each model in the charging unit can move up to this number of inches. This is the charge distance this turn. The first model you must move must finish within an inch of any model. Yeah, it's the closest model to the closest enemy model. No models in the charge unit can move uh, within an inch of an enemy unit that was not targeted in the charge phase. If this is impossible, the charge fails, no models uh, move that phase. Once you've moved all the models in the charge unit, choose another eligible unit and repeat the above procedure until all eligible units uh, that you want to make charge moves have done so. No unit can be selected to charge more than once in each charge phase. So, I'm wondering about unit coherency. I think that maybe is covered. You still have to keep within uh, two inches uh, to keep maintain unit coherency. Yep. I think it is covered here. Units, units move and fighting units. Uh, models move and fighting units made up uh, up of one or more models. A unit must be set up, finish any sort of move as a group, with every model within two inches horizontally, six inches vertically of at least one other model from their unit. This is called coherency. Um, if you're split up during the battle, uh, you must re-establish coherency the next time you move. That's, that's the same, the same as 7th. So if you do charge multiple targets, you do have to maintain your unit coherency. Uh, if you do have to maintain it, and then if it's lost by casualties being removed, you've got to try and get back together again. So that's all fine, that's all been maintained, that's good. So a heroic intervention. After the enemy has completed all of their charge moves, any of your characters within three inches of an enemy unit may perform a heroic intervention. Any that do so can move up to three inches, as long as they end their move close to the nearest enemy model. Right, so character, so you've got a character behind, you've got all co-op boys here, character at the back, uh, they get charged, um, and you find that your character's within three inches of an enemy model, and you can move in to join in a combat. Well, there's a combat taking place over here, you've got a character over there, he actually ends up nearby the combat, he can charge in as well, so it's worth remembering that. So that means, that means you have a character with models all nearby, and the opponent declares, right, I'm charging your unit, and then uh, your character will be left out of the, the melee, but because he's close by, he can use his heroic intervention and he can join in the combat as well. So that's a good rule. That's, that's fine. 
so uh, fight face here. I know this this video's come out. Uh, I plan to release it before the rules are actually fully available. So um, some of you, uh, many of you watching, won't at this stage won't have access to the rules. Uh, but you've been able to pick up the rules from what Games Workshop have talked about uh, and pre-released, talking about the different phases. Uh, they have given a heads up as to what to expect, and then the rules are coming out very soon. You're then going to have full reference to them uh, to be able to. Uh, give more detailed comments uh, and to check what I've said here makes sense and is in line with what the rules say. Yeah, okay, so this is the fight sequence. Um, you choose a unit to fight with, you pile it up to three inches, you choose your targets, choose your melee weapon, and then resolve close combat attacks. You roll to hit, you roll to wound, the enemy allocates the wound, same as shooting. Uh, you make your saving throws, then your damage, and then you can make a further consolidation of three inches, like a follow up piling move. Uh, choose it, which is very straightforward. It's three inches at the start of combat, three inches at the end. Nice and easy. Uh, choose unit to fight with. Now this is where it's changed here, because uh, initiative's been done away with, and you then fight in the order they give you here. Any unit that charged, or has models of an inch of an enemy unit, can be chosen to fight in the fight phase. This includes all units, not just those controlled by the player whose turn it is. So both sides do get to fight still in combat. Uh, all units that charge this turn fight first, so you resolve all your charges on the table. All those units that have charged, they will go first, guaranteed. The player whose turn it is picks the order in which these units fight. After all charging units have fought, the players alternate choosing eligible units to fight with, starting the player whose turn it is. So I resolve all my charging combats, and then I then pick a combat, uh, the one that wasn't a charge. And once I've resolved that, the opponent then gets to pick one of his units to fight. And it's choosing eligible units to fight with until all eligible units on both sides have fought once each. No unit can be selected to fight more than once in the fight phase. If one player runs out of eligible units, the other player completes all of their remaining fights. One unit after another. A fight is resolved in the following steps. Yeah, so instead of, um, instead of choosing a combat, yeah, I think this is right here. Instead of choosing, let's resolve this combat here, I do my attacks, you do yours, now you choose a unit. So I might choose this unit to fight with, the opponent may choose his to fight back with, or he may go and choose one of his other units that's fighting. So there's a bit of tactical stuff going on there as well. Um, you're picking your units to fight with, um, and uh, it means that you, you sort of go by your priorities as to what ones you want to strike first in. Uh, and which ones are less important. Piling, you may move each model up to three inches. This can move be in any direction, so long as the model ends, the move closer to the nearest enemy model. Right, so it's got to be closer to the nearest enemy model. Which again is fair and it's fine. Choose targets. So it's, you may move each model. You don't have to. So that can help you with keeping your unit coherency if you've charged multiple targets. Same as same condition. Choose targets. First, you must pick the target unit or units for the attacks. To target an enemy unit, the attacking model must be within an inch of that unit, or within one inch of another another model from its own unit is within one inch. So it's front rank miniatures basically, and then those that are within an inch of those fighting in the front rank. So two ranks basically, give or take, uh, but you just measure it an inch, just there. This represents the unit fighting in two ranks. And there you go. Models that charge this turn can only target enemy units that they charged in the previous phase. If a model can take, make more than one close combat attack, it can split them between eligible target units as you wish. Okay. Uh, so, a, a Hive Tyrant surrounded by two Eldar units it's from what I'm seeing here, he might be able to split his attacks between the two units to try and knock them both down. Could be wrong, uh, but I think that's the way it is. Sim uh, similarly, if a unit contains more than one model, each can target a different enemy unit. Again, so you can split your attacks as well. In either case, declare how you split the unit's close combat attacks before any dice are rolled and resolve all attacks against one target before moving on to the next. Yep, yeah, so number of attacks then here. The number of close combat attacks a model makes against its target is determined by its attack's characteristic. 
you can roll one dice for each close combat attack being made. For example, if a model has an attack characteristics of two, then it makes two attacks, yeah. And all of that information is in your stats. Here, so Skyweaver jet bike, three attacks. Um, so there's, there's no universal rules now for if you charge, you get an extra attack. Um, that's not cut, that you don't, that's not mentioned in here. Um, if you have a pistol and a, or two close combat weapons, you don't, uh, you no longer get an extra attack for that. But having said that, there are some close combat weapons that give you an extra attack um, as a standard, uh, like a chainsaw, I believe, for example. An orc chopper gives you an extra attack. Just, you don't need the combination of slugger and chopper to get the extra attack. It's just carrying that melee weapon gives you an extra attack. And that's the way they've covered that now as well. So it, it just means you, everything's contained uh, in here. You check your attacks and then just remember to check your melee weapons to see if there's any bonuses there for attacks. So then you choose your melee weapon. Uh, if you don't have one, you just fight with a close combat weapon, which is just a, a flat stat roll. You use, use your uh, melee. Uh, use your strength of the user and the damage is just one with no AP minus. Now this is a, a little twist here that they've done which I think is quite cool. If a model has more than one melee weapon, choose which it will use before on the dice. If a model has more than one melee weapon and can make several close combat attacks, it can split its attacks between these weapons however you wish. Declare how you will divide the attacks before any dice are rolled. So uh, one of the new Primaris Marines is armed with like a, one of the new Power Fists and he's got a Power Sword on the other hand. You can say, right, I've got four attacks. I'm going to do two on this target, two on that target, or I'm going to do uh, two of each on the same target. A lot of uh, versatility in there for choosing different types of close combat weapons. So, pretty cool. You resolve your attacks. It's all the same. Yep, ah, but you use your weapon skill. You don't compare on a chart, so I'm weapon skill five, use weapon skill four, you don't do that anymore. Um, you just simply, again, it's all contained in here. You just look up your weapon skill. Your weapon skill is a three plus, just means you always need a three plus to hit, regardless of who you're fighting against. Uh, you resolve your attacks, you consolidate. Uh, just that. And that's it. So you remove your casualties. Yeah, and you just consolidate up. So once that's all, that's all done, remember we've still got morale to do um, for uh, the shooting that's damage that's been done and combats, and then now right at the very end, uh, phase number six is the morale phase just here. And again, they've simplified this, made it, they've simplified it, and there's no more running away anymore. Um, you just, you lose casualties based on a dice roll. In the morale phase, start with the player whose turn it is, players must Take morale tests for units from their army that have models have had models slain during the turns. So there's no more 25% casualties. Um, if you lose one model, you have to take morale. So to take a morale test, roll a dice, add the number of models that have been slain. So you roll a four. I lost three models. This is a seven. If the result of the morale test exceeds the highest leadership characteristic in the unit, the test is failed. So you rolled a seven in total, your leadership is eight, you're fine, you haven't uh, caused a problem. But if you rolled a six and you've lost uh, four models, and that's a score of a 10, and your leadership is a eight, you've failed by two. Each point the test is failed by, one model in that unit must flee and is removed from play. You can choose which models flee from the units you command. So, sounds okay. Um, bit of a disadvantage for big units that take a lot of casualties. Big mob of orc boys, they lose 12 casualties. <laughs> They're gonna lose a lot of, um, without any, just say there's no other modifiers or bonuses. If, if they roll, it's very likely uh, they are gonna they lose 12 casualties, they're on plus 12, and then plus the dice score, and then you remove that many, it's just horrendous for them. So for morale, small units are better, for sure. Not sure about this. Not so sure. Big units could be in a lot of trouble. You can virtually see big units being decimated and then 
d uh, destroying themselves with, with the, in the morale phase with a bad roll, and they just the models are all gone. Another big disadvantage of this: it says models and not wounds. You've got unit of all mega knobs, um, each with three wounds each, and then you foul morale by one or two. You've got to take off whole models, so you're losing all three wounds. It's, it's not good. So I think there's a disadvantage to having big mobs by the sounds of it, not maybe not good for Tyrions and Orcs and so on. Uh, just presuming that you know without any knowledge of the of the uh, modifiers that you can get. Um, and then uh, as well, models of multiple wounds could find themselves in a fair bit of trouble as well, potentially if they roll badly. It's a bit tactical there when you're choosing your arm, army and your unit selection. Bearing that in mind, mega knobs, for example, maybe small units are better, much more likely to pass them around, not have to remove whole models. Uh, so you're going to, have to cover transports. Transports are talked about here. Sort of, not much information about vehicles, but they've covered transports just here. So transports. Some models are noted as being a transport in the data sheet, and again, it's all in here. You go down to keywords, uh, vehicle fly void weavers, for example. Uh, here's one, the Star Weaver is a vehicle, transport, fly, and Star Weaver. Uh, I've just noticed something, let me just bring that book back. Some people may say this isn't fair, but I've just noticed something. Do, 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 do. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, now this is... Um, this might <laughs> cause trouble here. Uh, remember we are talking about falling back. Uh, if a unit falls back it cannot advance or charge later that turn. A unit that falls back also cannot shoot later that turn unless it can fly. Unless you can fly you, you are allowed to shoot if you pull back. So you go to Star Weaver here which is a, a skimmer in 7th edition but it's vehicle transport fly Star Weaver. So these vehicles, skimmers, can pull out of combat and fire, but a land raider can't. There's food for thought there. <laughs> Unless you're a hovering land raider. <laughs> There's no, no clues about as to what Games Workshop are planning to release uh, there for the Primaris Marines. So uh, back to transports. Um, so it's noted on your data sheet. These vehicles, ferry troops. Da, 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 da. Okay. So uh, following the rules described. Uh, how units can embark and disembark from transports and how they're used to move their passengers across the battlefield. Note that a unit cannot both embark and disembark in the same turn. You can't vehicle hop, same as what 7th edition was. Transport capacity. All transports have a transport capacity listed on the data sheet. This determines how many friendly models and of what type they can carry. A model's transport capacity can never be exceeded. That's fine. Uh, now, this is where it's interesting. You can set up a transport units. You can set up a transport, units can start the battle embarked within instead of being set up separately. Declare what units are embarked inside the transport when you set it up. So if I get this right, you can set up, you've got your uh, transport capacity of 10, so you've got a land raider maybe, and you've got two units of five, um, one unit of Space Marine Scouts, one unit of uh, five man tactical marines, those two separate units, you couldn't do that in 7th, but in 8th it seems they can both go inside the transport. Plus your characters as well, as long as you go up to, uh, don't exceed your uh, transport capacity. So that adds a different dynamic to the game. Again, I, I can't see why that wouldn't be realistic. Different types of units being allowed to go inside a transport if a commander wanted to do that. I um, can't see why uh, that wouldn't be allowed, so I haven't got a problem with that one. Uh, so embark. If all models in a unit end their move within three inches of a friendly transport, you can embark within it, remove the unit from the battlefield and place it to one side. It's now embarked. Uh, so you, all the, again, simplification here, all hatches, entry points all disappeared. You just have to get within three inches of any part of that vehicle and you can embark. Embarked units cannot normally do anything or be affected in any way whilst they're inside, unless specifically stated abilities that affect other units within a certain range of no effect. Like the characters, for example, I think, unless it says otherwise. If a transport is destroyed, uh, so remember we don't, you don't have different results now on vehicle damage. Um, you instead have uh, vehicles with a number of, with a certain number of wounds, have a uh, result chart here. 
So we've got a Doom Scythe, it has 12 wounds, so it's got more than 10. So they give you this chart here. Uh, remaining wounds, uh, 7 to 12, so you're in pretty good health, your movement's unaffected, and then uh, ballistic skill free, free attacks. Uh, 4 to 6 wounds remaining, you're half dead, your ballistic skill drops by 1. Uh, your movement, you can't max your movement out, you drop it by a quarter here, and then D3 uh, attacks, and then remaining wounds 1 to 3, you're virtually destroyed, your movement slows right down, it's a 5 plus ballistic skill, and you're at only 1 attack, so you're pretty useless. Just this, that, that's how that works. Uh, there, but then once you reach that point where you're destroyed, any units embarked within it immediately disembark as disembarkation rules before the transport model is removed. You must then roll one dice for each model just set up on the battlefield for each roll of a one. A model that disembarked, your choice is slain. Okay, so random allocations are gone. You roll up your dice, any ones you then choose, him, him, and him, they'll die, and that's it. And it is slain, so regardless of wounds, armor saves, invun saves, it's a bit of a risk there, bear that in mind when you're transporting. Disembarkation. Any unit that begins its movement phase embarked within a transport can disembark before the transport moves. Uh, so disembarkation now works at the start of movement phase, you disembark. You can't disembark any other point. Set it up on the battlefield so that all the models are within three inches. It's all nicely straightforward here. Not within an inch of enemy models. Any disembarking model that cannot be set up is slain. So there's no more, um, I'm gonna move my rhino six inches, pivot, get out of this hatch, three inches. Uh, that's all gone. You just say, right, disembarkation with this unit, they get out three inches, and then the, the transport then just does its own thing. And this is your restrictions. Unit that disembark can act normally, uh, move, shoot, charge, and fight during the remainder of their turn. Uh, note, though, that even if you don't mo move disembarking units further in your movement phase, they still count as having moved for any rules such as uh, heavy weapons and so on. Fine, okay. So I think you can disembark three inches and then move six. Could be wrong. Uh, disembark, set up so it's all in three. And you're free to move normally, yeah. So start of your turn, disembark three inches for any point in the vehicle. There's no hatches anymore, I believe. Uh, and then you can move up to six. And then you can Shoot, charge, and fight as normal as well, so you can charge also. So pretty good. Pretty good actually, nice and flexible. Pretty straightforward there with the rules for transports. And, and that actually covers everything on this sheet. So we've covered, we've covered the core rules. And, and then really you just, you take that and then you just refer to this, your entry, your unit entries with all your other rules. All your special rules are in here, your armor values, what you need to hit in combat, strength and toughness, uh, your weapon types, all they can do, the ranges are all covered here, abilities, your war gear options as well when you're trying to work out your points as well. So that is that covered. So as I said, at the, start, at the point of filming here, uh, the rules aren't available um, for most people, uh, but then very soon you're going to have the rules with you uh, and then you can uh, refer to that uh, as uh, you check out what I've said in this video is accurate. But a couple of points uh, for discussion there uh, that we've covered, so chat about that in the comments section. Uh, so that's the rules, that's pretty much uh, showing you how it's changed from 7th edition, pretty much run through how to play the game. Uh, it's quite straightforward as you can see by this video here, it's not too long, I've actually covered all six of the phases now. Loads of stuff's been severely uh, simplified. A good amount of it's for, for good, I think, because seventh was clogged up and, and slowed down. A lot of the stuff that's um, bogged the game down, although it was realistic, a lot of it, it did slow the game down. A lot of areas uh, where arguments could have taken place has gone, um, so there's that as well. Um, but then, at the cost of some things that maybe not be so realistic as well. Um, so, but leave your comments there. It'd be, it'd be fascinating to read your feedback. Um, so uh, leave your comments and feedback there. It, if you agree with me on some of the points I've, I've made, or if you disagree and you say, actually, no, I think these rules are good, leave that in the comments section below. But uh, that's the changes between 7th 
an 8th edition and pretty much we've covered how to play uh, Warhammer 40,000 8th edition as well. Keep a look out on the channel uh, for index reviews. Now I'm going to do these how I, I used to do the codex reviews. I thought about doing running through the entire book. It's going to end up being a very long video. You're going to have to try to sift through the video to reach the faction that you want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break these down into individual faction index reviews. So there'll be a separate video for Craftworld Eldar, uh, Drakari or Dark Eldar, Yanari, Harlequins, Necrons. I'm going to have it's all the videos laid out nicely for you. You can turn to those uh, and I'll run through the rules. Uh, and I just review them how I used to do the codex reviews on the channel. So I'll choose, uh, go through all of the units, weapons, and options. So I'll give you an idea of what I would go for. Uh, if I have the army currently, you'll get an idea of, of how I might change the current army that I have. Um, and then those are your standard review videos. And then over on the plus channel, and uh, I'll then develop uh, those videos into uh, army development videos where you'll get to see how I'm actually going to put these new armies together and then on the plus channel you can have an input uh, and leave your suggestions and comments and feedback and help me shape and form each of these armies and you can have a part in helping them uh, convert over into 8th edition and help put those armies together. Very, very exciting to refresh uh, these armies and the new armies I'm working on as mentioned earlier the Harlequins uh, I've painted up a number of models for them uh, but 8th edition has come along so I've got a, a clean fresh palette here uh, to create a new army list based on 8th edition. But that's the video. Uh, thanks for watching. Keep a look out for more 8th edition releases on the channel in the near future and tune in next time.